All right, folks, good evening. Thank you for joining us for our spring financial aid night. My name is Amy Thompson. I'm a college and career counselor um, at the high school. As we get going, let me just give you a couple of little logistics about how today works. We are in webinar view, which means that we cannot see you, but you can see and hopefully hear us. Um, this session is being recorded. It will be posted uh, later this week to my YouTube channel. Um, if you'd like to communicate with us, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. You can type questions to us. Um, I will do my best to answer questions throughout the presentation. I'm not the presenter tonight, um, which is wonderful for me. Um, but you can type questions in throughout the presentation. I'll do my best to answer. And if not, we'll hold them and we will use them at the end for Q&A. Um, any questions that you type um, are just viewable by myself um, and our other panelists this evening. Um, when you ask the question, if we answer the question, um, we can choose to reply just to you if it's uh, a little bit more personal or if it's usable by everybody, I'll check and I'll just publish it so that everybody can see what the answer is. So that would be the way to communicate with us. There is not a chat box, so that's the way to go. Um, our presentation tonight will be just about an hour, so one of our shorter ones. Um, before we get going, I will introduce, um, I just want to say her, her name. I've got our Associate Director of Admission at Monmouth University's Financial Aid Office. It's Kristen Isaacson. So she's here with us this evening. And before we get started, we did just want to launch a quick poll to get an idea about who is with us tonight, um, what grade you all are from. So if you could just answer on what grade is your oldest high school student, that would be helpful for us just as we get started and gear this presentation. All right, it looks like we are actually majority sophomores tonight. We're running at Ooh. about 49% sophomores, 38% wow. juniors, Ms. Isaacson, and um, okay. uh, about 8, 10% freshmen or so. So kind of skewing towards a little bit later. So I guess we will cover some of those changes that are a little bit down the pike as we get okay. going. <laughs> okay. All right. So without a further delay, I am going to let you go ahead and screen share, get started. I'm going to stick myself on mute. Um, folks, don't forget about that Q&A button at the bottom and we'll go from there. All right. Here we go. Let's see. Uh, okay. So, uh, so yes, as Ms. Mrs. Thompson said, my name is Kristen Isaacson. I am Associate Director of Financial Aid at Monmouth University. I'm happy to give you this uh, general presentation about the financial aid process. Um, so the things that we're going to cover today, we're gonna go over some terminology and some tools that you can use during the financial aid process. Um, I will talk to you a bit about completing the free application for federal student aid or FAFSA. Um, this is geared, uh, what I have is geared toward the 23-24 school year. So that would be the first year for the juniors. Um, and as Mrs. Thompson alluded to, there are some changes coming down the pike for 24-25. So sophomores, there are going to be some changes. I'll try to point out some things as we go along as to where we're expecting to see changes for that year. I'm going to review some types and sources of aid. Um, eight programs that are available and also at the end and throughout the whole presentation, I will give you some tips as well. So let's get started here. So first thing, the first thing that I like to tell you about is a website. It's studentaid.gov. And this is your one-stop shop for all things related to federal financial aid, all in this one website. Um, you can complete the federal aid application through studentaid.gov. Uh, you can read all about the federal aid programs. Uh, there um, uh, is the application process for federal student loans, uh, both for students and for parents, and also information about managing those loans after graduation. Um, for the 23-24 FAFSA or free application for federal student aid, it will become available on October 1st. So you're going to always complete your FAFSA starting. So first day that it's available is October 1 in the student's senior year. 
So juniors, we're, we're, we're starting to get into the countdown to October 1. Um, sophomores, obviously, you will have a whole another year and so on down the line. Um, but it is October 1 of the senior year that the FAFSA for the student's first year of college opens up. So again, as I said, October 1 is day one. Um, you'll want to check with the colleges that your student is interested in for any then deadlines um, that are out there. And um, for some schools, the deadlines can be in conjunction with the type of application you're doing, whether you're doing an early decision, early action, or regular decision admission application. Uh, the FAFSA is completed each year for each student that's in college. So if uh, parents, this is going to be student number one, and you have another one two years behind. Once number two is in school, you're going to be completing two FAFSA applications. FAFSAs are student specific. They are not family applications. So each student who's in college needs one and needs one each year. Uh, last thing to note about completing the FAFSA is that you are using income from two years prior. So that means for the 23-24 FAFSA, you're going to be using your 2021 income. And that's what you're doing your taxes on um, currently is the 2021 um, year. Uh, one of the other things I do want to point out, this little owl is um, Federal Student Aid's chatbot. And so when you go to studentaid.gov, uh, Aiden is the name of the chat bot, will pop up in your lower right corner um, and ask if um, uh, it can provide assistance to you. Um, it's not a real person, but it is a way for you to get answers to questions, you know, even in the middle of the night if you have a burning financial aid question. Uh, so want to make you aware that the FAFSA is completed electronically. You can choose to do it um, on a uh, computer, you know, laptop, desktop, that kind of thing, tablet, or you can choose to do your FAFSA on your phone. Um, and that's done through the My Student Aid mobile app, which is free, can be downloaded for Android or Apple through the appropriate stores. Um, and you can uh, save, complete, submit the FAFSA all through the mobile app. You can use what's called the IRS data retrieval tool, which allows uh, income to be transferred from the IRS into the FAFSA application, track your progress. Um, you also can um, move from device to device. So you can start something on a phone, finish it on a computer, whatever you want to do, but just wanna make you aware that there is the capability of completing the, um, the FAFSA uh, on your phone. And also please note that all the screenshots and things that I'm showing you tonight, um, this is the way they look right now. Um, at this point, I'm not sure what, um, as far as look might be changing for 23, 24, let alone for 24, 25. So um, things look as they look currently. Okay, so um, we're going to be completing this free application for federal student aid. All colleges are going to ask you to complete this FAFSA at a minimum. Um, and so what happens with it? You're going to provide a lot of information on it. There's going to be income information, asset information, household size information, number in college, ages, things like that. All of that information is going to get run through a formula that's called the federal methodology. This formula was created by Congress and it uses that information on the FAFSA and determines what we call your expected family contribution or EFC. Um, on this slide, I'm just trying to show you that the EFC is a measurement of the students and families' um, ability to pay for post-secondary education expenses. And I like to point out that we have the student contribution as well as the parent contribution for those students that do have to provide parental information. So that means that if the student did um, earn money in 2021, um, if the student has their own assets, that those need to be reported on the FAFSA and they will be taken into consideration in the expected family contribution. Also some things about some additional items about the expected family contribution. Um, this is an index number that's used by the financial aid office to determine the student's aid eligibility. And it does stay the same regardless of college choice, because again, the information that determined that expected family contribution comes from the application that the student submitted. So really the EFC belongs to the student, not to the college. Keep in mind that the expected family contribution is not necessarily the amount of money that you will pay for the student's education, and nor is it the amount of federal aid the student will receive. 
Okay, so got some more terms here to um, make sure that you understand as you move forward in the financial aid process. Um, we do have a term in financial aid called cost of attendance. It's the overall cost to attend the school for the upcoming school year. It includes things like tuition and fees, room and meals, um, things that the school will bill you for. And then also includes other indirect expenses like books and supplies, transportation expenses, personal expenses, items that you're not necessarily billed for, but you do need to prepare for. Um, all students are going to need some sort of books, some sort of supplies, whatever it might be for college. With transportation, they do need to get to and from their campus, and that can mean different things depending upon how far away that campus is. And personal expenses, we consider things like um, Clothing, entertainment, as you can see in my pictures there, we have some toothpaste and deodorant and shampoo, you know, things that the student needs to live while they're in school. Um, and you do need to plan for those expenses so that your student does have those items while they're in school. And one more term that I do want to tell you about is something called financial need. So again, you'll see this in information as you're reading about aid programs and things like that. You might see that something says it's a need-based program or you must have financial need to receive this award. So we have to have a way to determine who has financial need and for how much. So to do that, we do this little equation. And we take your cost of attendance, so the overall cost to attend the school for the school year, we subtract from it that expected family contribution that came from the federal government through all the data that you put on the FAFSA application, and that leaves us your financial need. And then with that, the school can determine, you know, how much uh, aid they're able to award. I did put some numbers to this, so some, some examples about financial need. So let's say you're looking at two different schools. And I've got one school with a cost of attendance of $40,000 and another with a cost of attendance of $65,000. And in my example, my EFC stays the same. So I've got a $15,000 EFC in this example, just to talk round numbers. So in school number one, I have $25,000 in financial need. School number two, $50,000 in financial need. So in real life, what does that mean? So at school number one, I can get up to $25,000 in need-based aid. At school number two, up to $50,000 in need-based aid if it's available. Not every college and university across this country has the funding to fulfill 100% of financial need for all their students. Um, so there are some that do. You can put it into Google and find a list. Um, you know, and those that can't fulfill all of the financial need fill, uh, fulfill as much as they possibly can of the student's financial need. Okay, so that ends the terminology. Um, some tools that I want to provide you with. Um, one is what's called a net price calculator. This can be very helpful at getting an early estimate of your aid eligibility at a specific college or university. Um, each college and university has to have a net price calculator on their website, um, and you do have to complete it uh, separately for each school that you're potentially interested in. You'll provide um, some income information, and then the net price calculator will give you an estimate of the aid for which you're eligible based on what you put in, um, and will also provide you cost information for that particular school. Um, so while there is no single place to just enter the information once, the link that I have at the bottom of the screen, you can go to that link, collegecost.ed.gov slash net dash price, and type in the school that you'd like to do the net price calculator for, and it will take you right to their net price calculator. You still have to go back and enter another school if you want to do something else, um, but at least it cuts down on you having to search through um, a school's website to find their net price calculator. So it can be a very helpful tool in getting, again, it's an estimate, but just an early read on what your student's eligibility might be. And then the other tool that we have is for, it's the Federal Student Aid Estimator. So what this is, is a way to um, 
really kind of do a FAFSA in a dress rehearsal state. So you can enter um, the information that's needed and it will calculate an estimated EFC for you, um, give you some information about your federal aid eligibility, but this is not an official FAFSA. It's not being sent out to any schools for awarding purposes, um, but it is a nice just way to get an early idea of what your expected family contribution looks like. So um, you can get to it through the link that I have on the screen, or if you get to just studentaid.gov, you can access it there um, as well. Okay, where did my cursor go? There it is. Okay, so um, one thing just for everybody to be prepared for um, is that in completing the FAFSA electronically, whether it's through the phone or on a computer, you will need to sign off on the application, both student and parent. Um, so student has to sign off on it and one parent has to sign off on the FAFSA. This is done through what's called an FSA ID. And the FSA ID is a username and password that you create that becomes then your legal signature for the FAFSA as well as federal loans. Um, and it also is then the access, you know, back into the application. Um, so be um, aware that you will have to set up an FSA ID. It can be done ahead of time, so before you complete your FAFSA, or it can be done within the FAFSA process. Um, it's probably a good idea to set it up ahead of time. Um, I wouldn't say you need to do it quite yet for the juniors, um, but you know, like a week before you're ready to file, um, so that that way this part of the process is done. There, are everything, all the information is verified and ready to go. So. Um, Again, you can access the FAFSA itself through the link that I put there at the bottom of the screen, or if you just remember studentaid.gov um, and you go to the menu at the top that says apply for aid, you click the drop down, the very first thing it will say is complete a FAFSA. Um, if you've never completed a FAFSA before, this is your first time, you're going to click start here and that will bring you to start a new application. Um, you become a returning user once you've completed an application, and if you need to go back in and correct something, um, you left off a school when you originally submitted it and you need to add them on, then you would use um, the login button to do that. Okay, so again, I'm trying to show you what things look like. Um, this is would be if you're on some sort of like either a desktop, laptop type computer. This is just some information about what the screens look like. Again, current to what they look like now to give you an idea of the kind of um, what it looks like and also to know what tools and help is there right on the screen for you. So when we go up to my top arrow uh, across the top, you're going to be able to track your pro progress. So you've got the green check mark. If you've completed a section, we've got this filled in with blue. This is the section we're working on. And then we have all the rest of the sections left to go. But it is nice to track your progress. Um, this screen needs student information. So it's telling you this right up at the top. Any screens that need parent information, we'll say parent information on them. Parents, please keep in mind the majority of the application is student information. So it's really, 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 really important um, to put the right information in the right spot. Um, we see problems where parents complete applications um, and put their income information in the student income section as well as in the parent income section. So then both of you make the same amount of money, which would greatly affect the student's aid eligibility. Um, we're working with a student who um, just uh, transferred in this semester who um, they got the name right. The student is the name on the FAFSA, but then um, has the father's birth date on it which then again changes the eligibility, makes the student older than they actually are. So again, it's really important to be sure that you're putting student information where it belongs and parent information where it belongs. And it always, as it says here on my arrow here on the right, because the FAFSA belongs to the student, you and your always, unless otherwise noted, refers to the student. So it's always important to keep that in mind. And finally, if you're not sure how to answer a specific question, there'll be these little question marks and circles at the end of the um, answer box. 
you can click on those question marks and it will open up um, a help box and give you more information about how to answer that specific question. So you've got help right there for each of the questions. Okay, just some quick information about the general eligibility requirements to complete a FAFSA. So in order to receive aid, the student will ultimately need to earn a high school diploma or, if it's, a, or it's equivalent, and there is a place on the FAFSA to list that information, including the high school name. Um, uh, in order for aid to be awarded, the student does need to be accepted for enrollment in an eligible program at an institution. Um, students do need to be U.S. citizens or eligible non-citizens, and students also need to have a valid social security number. So I'm just going to give you a few highlights of the types of information that are needed to complete the FAFSA. So there's a bunch of student demographics that are needed because, again, um, this is the student's aid application. Um, and so the whole first part is all student demographic information, their social security number, should citizenship status, marital status, uh, state of legal residence, level, um, the highest level of parents' um, school completion. So all of those items should be relatively easy to complete. Um, then uh, it will move into questions that determine whether or not um, Parent information needs to go on the FAFSA. Um, basically for age, because this again, um, the first item that I have up there, born before January 1, 1999, that date will change every year. So basically you need to be 24 in order to be an independent student. But since I know I have people here in various grade levels, um, that um, item, the year that you need to be born before changes each year with the new FAFSA. Um, so the way that the section works in determining whether or not parent information needs to go on the FAFSA is if any of the items that I have on this slide or the next slide apply to the student, then they don't need to put parent information on the FAFSA. If none of the items in, on these two slides apply to the student, then parent information is going on the FAFSA. So like I said, um, being over 24, is the student married? serving on active duty in the U.S. Armed Forces? Are they a veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces? Uh, since turning age 13, were both parents deceased, um, was a student in foster care, or beta dependent or ward of the court? Um, is a student an emancipated minor uh, in legal guardianship, um, working on a master's or doctorate program? Now, these next two, remember this report, refers to your student. So does the student have children who receive more than half of their support from the student? And does the student have dependents other than children who live with, um, who live with the student and receive more than half of their support from the student? But this is another question where sometimes students answer yes to having children, but really they don't and it's their parent. So just again, make sure that these questions are being answered as they would be for your student. And then finally, is a student homeless or at the risk of being homeless? So if none of these items apply to your student, they're going to be considered a dependent student and you will move on to the parent sections of the FAFSA. So parents, some things for you to be prepared to answer. Um, you will have to provide your marital status and your marital status is as of the day the FAFSA is completed. I know it can get a little confusing because we're using income information from two years prior, but marital status is as of the day the FAFSA is completed, okay? So that's important to keep in mind. Um, you can choose from, parents have never, never married, they are unmarried, but both legal parents living together, married or remarried, divorced or separated, or widowed. So um, I'm going to give some examples of these marital statuses just so that everybody has an idea of how they should be completing um, the FAFSA. Now, if the students, um, I have a student, his name is John. Both of his legal parents are married to each other. So great, marital status is married. We're going to put income information for both parents on the FAFSA. But let's say John's parents get divorced and John remains living with his mother. Um, that, um, and she has not married anyone else, so that the marital status is divorced, 
They will put divorced as the marital status on the FAFSA, and then the FAFSA will collect income information about just his mother. Um, and then uh, finally, let's say John's mother does marry somebody else. When they go to complete the FAFSA, the marital status is then remarried, and then both mom's information and step parents' information goes on the FAFSA. Um, so it's important, again, with marital status as of the day the FAFSA is completed, and then making sure you've got, particularly in divorce situations, the appropriate parent, um, that should be the one that's reporting on the FAFSA. And again, I'm giving you this information as it applies at least through 2324. Um, there are some expected changes in 2425 that may affect which parent is going on the FAFSA for um, uh, divorce situation. So um, the best thing is just stay tuned and um, I will probably be back in the fall to give another updated presentation, hopefully have some more information from the Department of Ed about upcoming changes. Um, we're also expecting another change in the next item that I have. Um, uh, parents, you will be asked about the household size as well as the number of students in college in the household, and we're expecting some changes within that number in college. I just don't want to confuse everybody um, because this is it's not happening yet, um, and we still have the 22-23 school year that hasn't started yet, as well as then 23-24 that my juniors are looking for for their first year, and then the changes would be happening after that. So kind of just stay tuned, and we'll keep you updated as things change. Um, parents, also keep in mind, you will have to provide your social security number, name, and date of birth, as well as your state of legal residence. Okay, so I mentioned a little bit earlier that we have something called the IRS data retrieval tool. This can be very helpful in completing the income portions of the FAFSA. Um, it is a way for you to um, download your income information directly from the IRS into the FAFSA all in real time. Um, you will go through some authentication. You'll choose whether or not to transfer the data and um, it will be transferred over and marked, um, all the fields that are transferred will be marked with transferred from IRS. Um, some tips just to know and understand about the IRS data retrieval tool um, is that um, when you transfer information over, like I said before, it says transferred from IRS. You're not going to see the actual uh, figures. Um, that information is masked for security purposes. However, we at the schools and state agencies can view the data because we do need to know that information to be able to do our jobs. Um, but I don't want you to panic when you don't see any numbers because that's the way it's meant to be. Um, currently, if you're a joint filer, um, you do need to manually enter um, the income earned from work on the FAFSA because the data retrieval tool doesn't do math. So when you fill out your tax return and if both of, well, whoever works, if it's one of you, two of you, it's all lumped together in one field on the tax return. And so the data retrieval tool doesn't know how to separate that out currently. So you do need to enter that information um, manually on the FAFSA. And you can get that through your W-2s. Um, uh, there's also, if you have a business, there's some information in the directions in the FAFSA to point you to where you need to go. Um, please, if you do use the data retrieval tool, which we recommend because it just makes life easier, um, don't change the data that's transferred over. That will be a guarantee of a school asking you for more information and more documentation as to why you made changes to IRS confirmed information. Uh, let's see. Okay, um, you may be asked questions about your assets um, when completing the FAFSA. Like marital status, assets are as of the day you complete the FAFSA. So again, we're using the income information from two years prior, but it's current marital status and current asset information. Um, the FAFSA, if you get asked the asset questions, it's looking at what you have in cash savings and checking accounts, investment net worth, as well as business or investment farm net worth. Um, I'm just going to give some brief information about the investments. Um, keep in mind that pretty much everything you have has to be reported as an investment. There's three exceptions currently. Um, you do not have to report the house you live in as an investment. 
You do not have to report the value of any life insurance, and you do not have to report the value of any money in uh, retirement plans. Okay. Um, so again, exclusions from investments, home you live in, value of life insurance, money saved in retirement plans. Pretty much everything else is an investment. Um, that includes any cryptocurrency that you might own as well. Um, it is considered a security and securities have to be reported on the FAFSA. Um, also, um, any money that you have in college savings plans, 529 savings plans also need to be reported. You'll want to make sure that you're reading the directions for reporting them, but that um, uh, is also something that is considered an investment. And then there'll also be a place on the FAFSA to list the colleges that you want to receive this information. You can list up to 10 at a time. If your student has more than 10 that they're looking at, um, then what you'll need to do is list 10, let it process. When you've gotten confirmation that it's been processed, you'll have to log back in and then overwrite some of the initial 10 with the schools that did not receive the information because it can't hold more than 10 schools at one time. Hey, Kristen, we got a couple yes. questions about investments. Do you sure. want to answer them now or at the sure. end? Sure. Yeah, why don't we? That's um, no problem. We've got a couple about 529s, and I think I got the part right where if the parent owns it, it gets um, put on the parent's part. If the parent owns uh, 529s for three kids, it, it goes on everybody's five uh, FAFSA. What if the student owns it? Is it a student asset? So, okay. So yeah, this is where, right. where 529s get a little weird. And, then, and I guess how also how much, like, how much is it going to hurt their aid eligibility, I guess, with the other well, thing. And that so I, if you I, have questions, stick it in the Q&A, please. Thanks. So, okay. So here we go. Um, I'm going to read this directly from the FAFSA because it just makes it easier because this is what the instructions are. So for a student who must report parental information, the 529 accounts that are reported, um, uh, they get reported as parental investments, including all accounts owned by the student and all accounts owned by the parents for any member of the household. So again, so to try to make it easier, we're looking at ownership, not beneficiaries, and we're looking at only accounts owned by parents and accounts owned by students. Um, and so once we have that part figured out, um, then all of it is reported as a parental asset, which that's the weird part, because basically for every other asset that a student owns themselves, it's going on the student side of the FAFSA. This is one exception that they make to make it different. Um, so if it's student owned or parent owned, it's a parent asset. And then it's also for any member of the household. So multiple kids, you have to add up how much you have for all the kids. And that grand total goes on the FAFSA because you can change beneficiaries as you see fit. So all of that has to be um, counted for, you know, the single student. Um, you said something about how does it affect their aid eligibility? Um, uh, just sort of like how bad of a hit does it take? Well, again, this is, it's all, <laughs> this it's all interwoven. How, yeah. How much do you have? You know, uh, what does the rest of the FAFSA look like? What I would recommend since all of, you know, what, except for a very few seniors, everybody's far enough out. What I would recommend doing is you could use that, um, the, the estimator, um, from the FAFSA, uh, Da, 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 this one, the federal student aid estimator. And you can go in because they've rebranded it. It had a different name. And when it had a different name, you could go in and like put in well, this one thing, change it, see what happens, you know? So I would recommend trying the that student aid estimator, um, you know, and putting in you know, what, what you have, put in zero, see what the difference is. Um, you know, it's... There are too many variables within the FAFSA for me to ever say, okay, this is your aid eligibility. That That's just not possible. There's too many pieces to the puzzle and too many tables and things like that. Um, if you, I mean, I would recommend using the online estimator. If you really um, wanted to calculate it all by hand, you can. The EFC um, calculation is out. The public can do it if you want to. Um, 
through the studentaid.gov website, they have a resources page and it, it's on that resources page and you could print out all the pages and calculate it. It's a fun thing that when you start to work in financial aid is one of the things that you get to do um, when you're new. Um, so that's another option as well. So what else did we have? Um, and I think I know this as well. Um, things like money and trust for your kids. What about business investments? Is that stuff reportable, not reportable, I guess is the only question. And then folks, my one caveat for everybody is that right now we're just talking about the FAFSA. There are a subsection of schools out there that require a different financial aid form called the CSS profile. And that's required in addition to the FAFSA. It's not an either or, it's a, it's a both or a just FAFSA thing. Um, and for schools that require the CSS profile, they often re, um, want more information. I kind of refer to it as the financial aid application, like wants to know what money's under your mattress um, and what's buried under the rocks in your uh, garden. So they, um, that does ask for retirement information, which may or may not get used in the school's uh, calculation of your aid. It depends upon the school, but it may also ask for, for other information that the FAFSA doesn't ask for. So just kind of be prepared for that as, as we go, because we're mostly talking about FAFSA because that's yeah. most of the schools out there. Yes, and the, the, the two forms have two different purposes and things like that. So again, it's just important uh, you know, one of the most important tips that I can give you is just to read directions, um, you know, and if you do, then you're going to answer things appropriately. So it's just making sure that, you know, if you've got a form that's asking, you know, for the home value or asking for non-custodial parent information, you know, then you'll need to provide it. Um, you know, this is specifically FAFSA information, but we got uh, trusts. So yes, trusts do have to be reported. Um, it doesn't matter the rules surrounding the trust, but, um, you know, because generally, no matter what, a trust can generally be broken for education expenses. So those do have to be reported as investments. Um, uh, I'm sorry, what else? What were, what were the other items that people just were asking about? Business, just if businesses like sole proprietorships, small businesses, I, I thought it used to be a hundred or more employees or, or it was yes. some number, but I'm not real positive. Yes. So currently, so currently, um, because I believe that this is another area that maybe there's, there's going to potentially be some changes to the, the reporting of assets. So currently the way that it works for businesses is if it's a family owned and controlled business with 100 or fewer full-time employees, then you do not have to report, um, a, net worth to the business itself. If there is property owned by the business, um, that would have to be reported just the business itself. Or so for example, you're, you know, um, a one person operation and you operate out of your home office, then, and you, there's no property, no, you know, you don't even have any inventory in whatever you do, then you wouldn't have to report that um, as a um, business net worth. Um, so again, it does um, give you information in the instructions so that you can be sure that for your business and depending upon what year you have to file, that you're reporting the appropriate information. Um, was that everything? Did I get? Yeah, you got them all. Thank you. Okay, I'm, no problem. I'm on the rest of them. I'm good. Okay. All right. So that was, that was it so far for the investment part? Yep. You could keep going, but I okay. figured maybe now, is the, maybe, maybe now is the time to hit it. Okay, sounds good. All right, so here we go. We're almost to the end of our FAFSA. So we just need to sign off on it. Um, again, we need to make sure that both student and one parent um, sign off on the application. Um, why does it say parent one, parent two in this slide? Because um, there could be students that do put two parents on it and only one of them has to sign off on it. So it's important to note every time you, when you initially submit and any corrections that you submit do need to be signed off on. And if it's not signed off on, it's not going to process it. So just be sure to do that. And you're using your signature is that username and password that you created for FAFSA purposes. Um, you know, you're done when you get to a confirmation page that says congratulations on it. Um, it will give you some other information about what's next. What's nice is that hopefully it should give you this part here that says, do you have another child who needs to complete a FAFSA? And you can click and go through um, and start the next student's application um, right away. 
It will also provide you on this confirmation page, uh, a listing of all the schools that you put on it and give you some um, data about those schools as well. Just important to note, you need to get to that congratulations page to know you're done. Okay, so we've got our FAFSA done, but then as Mrs. Thompson was just talking about, you need to make sure that the schools your student is interested in, do they have any other um, institution specific applications? One of those could be the CSS profile. This is a application put out um, by the college board used by about 300, 350 schools across the country. Um, it's used for their institutional aid. So the FAFSA would still be for federal aid purposes, but then schools with significant amounts, significant amounts of institutional aid will use the profile to further refine the students that they're going to award their institutional aid to. So then may ask questions about items that are not on the FAFSA. So the items that are excluded from investments, things like that, um, they may ask for on the profile. Um, so keep that in mind. Or the school may also just have their own intern, you know, their own, you know, XYZ university scholarship application. So it's important to know, you know, of each of the schools your student is applying to, not only when do we have to get our admission application in, when do we have to get the FAFSA in, are there any other financial aid related forms, and when do those need to be submitted? The way that you find out how much aid you will receive, um, that comes out through the individual colleges and universities. Yes, there'll be some brief information on your FAFSA confirmation page, but the actual um, financial aid awarding is done at the college and university level. And we put together um, a financial aid award offer and it puts together um, all of the funding available to your students. So the funding from the college itself. Um, any federal aid eligibility for New Jersey schools, if it's um, any state aid eligibility, um, we put that all together in one place. Um, in order to receive a financial aid award offer, you have to list the school on the FAFSA. That's our only way to receive it and any other documents that you might have to submit. And you must be admitted to the college. And then the school can send out the financial aid award offer. They may send it in the mail. It may be sent by email. It may be accessible through a student portal. Regardless of how you access the information, what's contained inside is the same. It's the types and amounts of aid the student is eligible for during the upcoming school year. And it should also provide cost information as well. Um, so you do want to make sure that you're reviewing these offers. If, if a school needs a response from you or something like that, just make sure that you're reviewing everything and responding as appropriate. You may be asked to provide additional documentation to a college or university. Uh, the federal government selects FAFSA applications to be verified, and verification occurs at the college level. So any documents that need to be submitted, you submit directly to the college, not to federal student aid. Um, for uh, the state of New Jersey, they also select applicants for verification, um, those that are potentially eligible for the state grants, you may get a request that way. Um, or, you know, some colleges want to verify every student that um, is applying. So again, if you get a request for additional documentation, please be sure to submit it to whomever is asking for it um, in, you know, promptly. Um, one of the things that I wanted to tell you, using that data retrieval tool on your FAFSA um, will cut down on the amount of documentation needed if you are selected for federal verification. Because if you transfer the income information, don't make any changes to it, then we know it's accurate and we don't have to ask you for copies of taxes and tax transcripts and things like that. And finally, if you're going to ultimately use any student loans, the school will walk you through that process. Okay, so... We want to make sure that we're covering all of our sources for aid when we're going through this process. So you need to know where the sources are. So the college itself is a source of aid. You may find aid from a college that's merit-based, which means it's based on some sort of prior academic performance, grades, standardized test scores, something like that. The college might have need-based aid, so based on financial information. Some schools have some of both. Um, you'll find if it's a school that is um, you know, heavily need-based, that they're, you know, really fulfilling financial needs. There's going to be very few scholarships because they're doing need-based aid. Um, you know, for those that are merit-based, they might have fewer, 
need-based dollars. So again, it's just something that, you know, generally you can find out on a school's website about the various aid programs that they have institutionally that may be available. Completing the FAFSA takes care of all your federal sources of aid. So all the federal grants, federal loans, and the federal work-study program you've taken care of through the FAFSA. For New Jersey state aid, completing the FAFSA, you've taken care of state aid because the application, the FAFSA application will automatically go to the state of New Jersey for evaluation. Um, <clears throat> then we have other sources of aid. So things like athletic scholarships, um, you know, at schools that do author athletic funding, um, your student may receive an athletic scholarship. Um, a financial aid office is not going to determine that award, but we will have to include it in that financial aid award offer ultimately. Uh, there are outside scholarships, so scholarships that come from sources outside of a college unit or university. Um, you may have local scholarships in town to apply for, and then you can use um, web-based uh, search engines for a broader reach. Um, if any veterans are out there, you may be able to um, transfer benefits to your, to your son or daughter um, uh, from your um, allotment. Uh, if I do have any veterans, first stop is to contact the VA. Uh, resident assistantships, are that's funding for students who are living on campus, um, but then are in charge of, you know, maybe a floor of students in a residence hall. And when you're a resident assistant, you are receiving some sort of monetary compensation for that. And then there are also tax credits available um, for higher education expenses. A little bit more about those. You can read more at, at irs.gov by looking at publication 970. It has all the information about the tax credits as well as the student loan interest deduction. So you have all these financial aid award offers. You need to know what you're looking at when you're reviewing them. So what do these things mean? So when we're looking at an award offer, if we see something that says grant, on the end of it. That's free money, so it does not have to be repaid. Um, usually based on financial need, doesn't have to be, but in general they are. So we like anything that says grant on the end of it. Uh, federal work study, uh, the application is the FAFSA. It is a need based, so you have to have financial need, uh, program where you can work um, on campus or at um, certain uh, community service locations off campus. So it's money that's earned. Uh, loans. If you see something that says loan on the end of it, yes, it does have to be repaid. It may not need to be repaid right away, but it does ultimately have to be repaid. So loans are borrowed money and they do have to be repaid. And scholarships. Scholarships too do not have to be repaid, so we like them as well. Um, on this slide, it's referring to scholarships as earned money because generally you're getting um, a scholarship that um, maybe is based on your grades, your test scores, um, a talent that you have, some sort of unique characteristic, something like that. So you've done something to earn that money, but still does not have to be repaid. So it's important to know what you're, you know, what you're reviewing when you're looking at the financial aid award offers. Uh, so just to give you some general information, some names of the awards from the federal government, there's the federal Pell Grant program. This is the federal government's main program. It is a need-based program, so you do have to um, meet specific qualifications of your expected family contribution in order to qualify. FSEOG is a federal supplemental grant that generally, um, if you receive Pell, you would receive a federal supplemental grant. However, that supplemental grant is limited, so schools get a limited amount to spend and it can run out. Teach Grant is for students interested in teaching in uh, high need subject areas in low income districts. Um, from the state of New Jersey, you can take a look at their website, which is HESA, H E S A A dot org. It stands for Higher Education Student Assistance Authority. Um, and the main grant program from the state is the New Jersey Tuition Aid Grant or TAG program. It is for New Jersey residents that remain in New Jersey for college, um, and it is a need-based grant program. NJ Stars is a program for students in the top 15% of their class to go to their local community college and have tuition and required fees paid for. Um, and then there is a 
the uh, NJ Stars 2. You have to do NJ Stars 1 before you can do NJ Stars 2. But NJ Stars 2, you can go on to any of the four-year institutions and receive additional funding um, to finish the four-year degree. EOF is the Educational Opportunity Fund Program. Again, it's a state-based program for students who are both academically and financially disadvantaged. Um, I, there also are some uh, other newer state programs that have come out um, at both the community college and for your public level. So again, if your student's looking to stay in New Jersey, there may be some other um, options. I don't know all the ins and outs of those programs because none of them, we don't, at Monmouth, we don't administer any of them, but I was doing some research for something else. So I do recommend, you know, if your student is looking to stay in New Jersey, definitely take a look at hisa.org for all of the um, opportunities through the state of New Jersey. And then again, don't forget your private sources for um, outside scholarships, using resources through the counseling office, but then also using free resources on the web um, to search for additional scholarship opportunities. And I would say that really by the fall, my junior, my current juniors, by the fall, you really want to be starting your search for outside scholarships because that's when they'll already be starting. There'll be some of them that'll start to open probably late fall um, and then all the way into next spring. Um, you know, if you wait until the summer after you graduate, it's going to be too late to search for outside scholarship sources. So it is something that does need to be done, uh, a search that does need to be done well ahead of, ahead of time. So just to keep that in mind. And it's a process you can continue to do while you're in college because your profile is changing when you're in school. You're not a high school senior anymore. You're an undergraduate student. Oh, now I have a major. I have a GPA. I'm in this organization. So it's something that you can continue to do even as you're in college. Um, I did mention the federal work study program. If you don't qualify for federal work study, um, you can ask the school if there is another way for you to be able to work on campus. And certainly off-campus jobs are an option as well. There are loans available um, to assist both students and parents in bridging the gap um, that you might have where the scholarships and grants run out. Um, the Federal Direct Loan Program is a loan program for students from the federal government. Um, the loans are borrowed by the student, no cosigner, no credit check involved, but the amounts that can be borrowed each year is limited. So then to again help make up the difference, there is a loan uh, from the federal government called Parent Plus. It is a credit-based loan. Parent is the borrower. Parent is responsible for repayment, but then you can borrow what are the rest that you need to cover the bill. You can even borrow funding on top of the billing charges to cover books and things like that as well. And then there are also private education loans from various banks, lenders, credit unions, that type of thing. Um, uh, they do with private loans, it is possible for a student to borrow with a cosigner or some of the lenders do also have parent programs as well. Payment plans, um, you can ask your school if they have um, an option to make monthly payments toward the tuition. So it may be a way for you to, you know, break up what you do want to pay out of pocket into monthly installments and fit it better into your monthly budget. Obviously, it's an option just to let you know that that's something out there. Okay, some other tips. Okay, read everything. Read it all. Read all the mail. Read all the email. Read everything promptly. You don't want to miss out on aid because you missed, you didn't read something and you missed out on a deadline. Read the instructions carefully so you're reporting the right information in the right place. Always review, again, before submitting. While most items within financial aid can be corrected, your process is so much smoother if things are correct right from the start. And keep copies of everything. Um, students should be involved in the financial aid process. The aid belongs to the student. Um, they're the ones attending our school. Um, there are actually are some a private, there's a privacy law that kicks in when they're in college that keeps all of their information private. Um, that's a conversation we can have at the next presentation um, about that, just letting you know that that's on the horizon. Um, and when you do have questions, talk to the financial aid office. We're here to help. We're here to help you for free. This is what we do every day. Um, so don't be afraid to, you know, talk to us. Um, you know, especially with what has happened with COVID, uh, a lot of financial aid offices have 
many more ways to contact them. I can tell you for our office, you can call us, you can come in, you can email us, you could send us a fax, you can drop into our Zoom room. So we have lots of ways to be able to help you out with whatever, with whatever situation you have. Um, and then finally, just some few last questions that you want to be thinking about as you move forward in the financial aid process. If your student gets an institutional scholarship or grant, so something from the college, is it a one-time thing? Can I renew it each year? And what are the requirements to get that award each year? If you've qualified for federal work study, what are the policies? Am I guaranteed a job? How much will I earn? Um, I've done such a great job with applying for outside scholarships. I've won a few of them. Great. Now that you have that information and know that, will it change any of the other aid that the college is offering you? Um, you know, if you have aid or borrow a loan to cover funding for books, how can I, how can I use that? How does that work? Um, and if there's been a change in circumstance, um, how does the school address that? You know, we do know that the FAFSA is collecting information from two years prior and things change within those two years. So we, you know, schools do have a way to collect documentation from you, review that documentation and see what it might um, change within the student's financial aid package. That's all done at the college level. Please don't send documents into federal student aid. They're not going to do anything with them. So again, that's another college uh, level item. And so we've made it to the end. Um, and thank you for those of you that have stayed through the whole thing. I do appreciate that. Um, I do wish you the best in your student's college search and then the financial aid process as well. Um, I think we might still have a couple other questions. And certainly if you do have them, please put them in the Q&A and happy to answer them. Give me one second. I was just replying to one on here <laughs> real quick. Um, and then I just wanted to hit on a couple of things that I think have um, come up maybe a little bit more recently. I did mention the CSS profile. Um, there's a total of about 250 schools or so that require the CSS profile, and there are more than 5,000 schools in the US. So it is not a huge proportion. Um, it does skew towards private universities, and it also does skew towards more selective universities as well um, in regards to who needs the CSS profile. A um, couple questions, a couple things about scholarships I wanted to mention. Um, during the, you may have noticed I do put out um, newsletter every, I don't know, six weeks or two months or so, and I try to include some scholarship opportunities there that are open to juniors or lower classmen. Um, for the most part, um, scholarships that are available to grades 9 through 11 are either really, really, really highly selective um, for a couple of highly selective junior scholarships, or they tend to be either essay-based or otherwise contest-based. As we moved into senior year, we get into more of those application-based merit scholarships. Um, the ones that are at towards the start of the year tend to be mostly more selective and have larger numbers. Um, so things like the Coca Coca-Cola scholarship, the Foot Locker Athletic Scholarship, those are large, many, 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 many tens of thousands of applicants um, for not, not tens of thousands of scholarships. Um, so that happens earlier on. As we move through the senior year, um, you start to see more um, statewide scholarships, county scholarships, things like that. During the senior year, I do keep a list that I update throughout the year. Um, it's available on the website if you want to take a look, but it will change by the time your child is a senior. Um, but that comes out throughout the year. We also have local scholarships that are available to just Hillsboro High School students. Um, and that comes out right around now, came out about two weeks ago and it's due in about two weeks. So that is also in the senior year. Um, I encourage students when you're looking at scholarships, especially in the senior year, you do also have to consider um, work effort versus likelihood of getting the scholarship. So sometimes, and how much else you have going on in your life. So I always encourage students, you know, consider, okay, if a scholarship is asking you to write four essays and um, it's gonna take a lot of your time and you're also in the middle of doing your college applications and you're in the middle of your coursework, that may not be um, the best odds of, of getting a scholarship at that time. And you, you kind of have to juggle all the balls. So sometimes students might have to let some opportunities pass them by so they can focus on the, um, some of the more likely possibilities that might come a little bit later when they're potentially a little bit less busy. 
Well, um, and also, can I add to yeah. that too? Cause I just, um, uh, I just put on our bulletin board outside not too long ago. And also on our social media, I was posting about searching for scholarships and things like that. And it, it kind of the same thing that if your student doesn't feel that they can do a complete application, get it submitted by the deadline, that is like their best effort, then no, it's probably not the best things. There are so many scholarship um, mm -hmm. uh, criteria that I read that they're like incomplete applications will not be um, they won't even be read. They won't even be looked at and don't even bother trying to send something after the deadline because we're not going to extend anything for you. So, and even some scholarships, even I posted something out today that the scholarship is open until April 15th or April 5th at 3 p.m. or until 500 applications are received. So it, some of them do even literally have a specific time of day that it has to be submitted. So you do need to be like kind of on it to make sure that you're submitting all the, the information that that particular award is asking you for by the time that they want it. Um, couple other things that I wanted to hit on. Um, one thing that I know we didn't mention because Christine comes from Mammoth, but you may have seen recently in the news, um, the Rutgers Scarlet Guarantee. So I do want to mention it because there's a lot of students who do apply to Rutgers. So Rutgers has just um, announced a new financial support program for families making $100,000 and less. Um, there is a plan there. It's kind of a, a graduated plan to cover portions of the tuition. So there is information on their website that is very detailed. I would absolutely recommend checking it out. Um, I know Rutgers is having a couple of information sessions in March um, about that program, and you'll look for more information about that um, to be released as, as time goes on. Of course, it's it's brand new, which for next fall, so we'll see where things are by the time you all are looking there. So if your family is in the $100,000 or less bracket, I would definitely recommend that Rutgers go on your list. There are another number of similar programs at other four-year schools in New Jersey. I don't believe any of them have $100,000 cutoffs, but there are some $80,000 cutoffs, some $65,000 cutoffs. So if you fall in that bracket, make sure that we're looking at some New Jersey schools, um, because in addition to all those other types of aid that Ms. Isaacson talked about, um, EOF, TAG grants, Pell grants, that this may be a way to, to cover that last gap for students who are in the lower income bracket. So make sure we're including um, very much those New Jersey schools so we're not leaving that money on the table. Um, also, for those who might be considering starting at Raritan Valley, Raritan Valley also gives financial aid out. Um, if you're looking to go to community college, they do use the FAFSA form as well. Couple things I wanna note there, there is currently a community college opportunity grant for families making $65,000 or less. So that is helping many of our families out. Um, and Ms. Isaacson also mentioned the New Jersey STARS program. That is a program for the top 15% um, of the graduating class. That's determined at the end of the junior year. It is based on the weighted GPA. So obviously I don't know what the top 15% of our junior year GPAs are gonna be by the end of this year. We make that determination um, early in the fall once we see you know, maybe who's left the district, things like that. I don't wanna be awarding things to people who have left the country and aren't coming back. And you know, we've got our rankings. Um, in this year's class, the top 15% uh, was right around a weighted GPA of just shy of a 101. So that probably gives you a fairly good idea about um, where you need to be in order to qualify for NJ STARS, just because I know that always uh, comes up. And we make those announcements. Um, students get that information in October of their senior year. We let them know if they are um, within that top 15% bracket. So that covers most of my things. And then the only other thing I kind of cover that I, I always am trying to be really realistic about is kind of the typical... Uh, Hillsborough family and what where they should expect to get their money from. So if you would call yourself middle of the road Hillsborough um, or above, um, you should know that what you will probably see um, from the federal government is you will probably see about $5,500 in federal loans. It might be one loan, it might be two loans, but it's going to total $5,500 because that's currently the maximum for freshmen. Our middle of the road Hillsborough families do not tend to qualify for Pell Grants or other grants, um, whether those be federal or state. Um, they may qualify for federal work study, um, which would give them permission to work on campus and, and make um, some salary. 
Um, but that tends to be what our students see in the way of federal and state financial aid if you're in the middle or above. Now, uh, you know, we certainly have families that are getting other types of aid, but you know, I want to be realistic for most of you. So most students would see their aid coming from the schools themselves in the form of sometimes need-based aid, because even though, for instance, Rutgers would not consider, uh, if your estimated family contribution was, was $75,000 and you or something, or you had a, a family income of, of $120,000, Rutgers is mostly not going to consider that to be very much financial um, need. However, other schools who have a higher cost of attendance might consider that to be need. So the rules aren't the same. You may find some of those more expensive schools are giving you need-based aid, even though your family income is $175,000. So that, that does happen. Um, what I really encourage our students to do is to make sure that they are taking cost into account when they make their list. And they're also taking merit scholarships offered by colleges account into account when they're making their list. That they very much are looking at where they're likely to most get the most merit scholarship from. Um, that tends to be private institutions, which can sometimes bring those below the cost of a public institution. Um, in-state institutions and a limited subset of out-of-state public institutions. Um, remember that when we look at out-of-state public schools, the job of those public schools is to support the residents of their state first and foremost. Um, and so, for instance, when our students apply to Penn State, they are very rarely receive any merit scholarship money. There are some other public institutions out of state that are more generous, and I'm always happy to share those schools with students. Um, but be realistic about what that is going to look like um, for your family when you're making your list so you don't get to the end um, and find you're, you're very disappointed. So you want to have a good mix of schools when you're looking. So I'm going to kind of cover a couple of other things. Um, someone asked about NJ stars. If none of the students use it, does no one earn it? That's correct. That's a state policy. Um, that top 15%. So if some students don't use it, um, nobody else gets to move into their spot. And we do always have students that um, use it. Certainly not all 15%, but believe me, the state could never fund it if everyone did. So <laughs> um, let's see. Um, HHS uses a total grade number and not a letter equivalent, right? So some of you that are earlier on probably haven't seen a whole lot about GPAs yet. Um, our GPAs are based on a 100 point scale. I did use a number higher than 100 and that's because we have a weighted GPA and an unweighted GPA. The weighted GPA does go over 100. Typically the maximum GPA in the class is somewhere um, by the end of junior year, which is different because by then students will have taken more advanced classes, um, students at the top of the class. The highest GPA is usually around 108 or so. Um, and we do not um, put anything on a 4.0 type scale at all. So you'll only see our numbers um, tend to be in that higher number, uh, higher in that 100 point range. Um, when should we work with the high school counselors to help with school selection? Um, counselors have been meeting, um, have done group meetings with juniors. A lot of the work um, really does need to be on you as a family. We're here as resources, but we do look for you to get started and then come, for, come to us for more suggestions. I meet with students. I'm available to meet with students starting um, in the spring of their junior year um, to help refine that list um, as well. But I do ask that you kind of get started. You got to come to me with some things that you've done and some reflection that you've done on what you're looking for in a school before we can be really effective in helping you to look um, and we encourage families, you can use SCORE, you can use the College Board site, you can use whatever site you want to do some searches um, to start building your own list out there. Um, trying to see if I can, I did get a couple of questions about twins and how that works um, in financial aid. So Kristen, I don't know if you can hit on that because I'm not so great on the explaining the twin knowledge, especially sure. with changes down the road. So, I mean, ultimately the main thing, uh, you know, they're two separate people, so they do need separate admission applications, separate FAFSAs. If it's a profile school, everything does have to be done two times, just like if they were siblings that were farther apart, just that, you know, you have to do it all at the same time. So in that sense, it's their, their, their own person. They all get their own applications. Um, Currently um, on the FAFSA, it does ask for the number of students that are in college. So if 
both of them will be attending to go to college, then it would be two in college. I mean, I don't know. You could have twins and even another sibling that's in, in college. So it's however many um, there are um, in college and so currently, um, and that does uh, affect the expected family contribution. Um, it does reduce the contribution, having multiple children in school, but this is expected to change um, for the 24-25 school year. Um, and that question's not going to be asked anymore. Just before everybody freaks out about it, um, you know, it's scheduled to happen. Like I said, it's not scheduled to happen until 24, 25. So my sophomores and freshmen that are out there, you know, we'll wait and see. And then, you know, for juniors, it's going to be, you know, an issue for your second year. But I know then, you know, you'll be at your college and, you know, they will assist you with any, um, you know, letting you know changes and, and things like that when that time comes. And you can certainly ask if the two, I mean, it's the same with siblings that, are, that aren't twins too. You can always ask a school, you know, if the two of them are interested in going to the same school or maybe your younger one is interested in going to the same one at the same, you know, at the same time as the older one. You can always ask if the school does any sort of sibling discount. Some schools do, some schools don't. So it's a valid question to ask. Just know that not every school offers a sibling discount. Yep, there are some schools out there with sibling grants that are published ahead of time and also um, legacy grants as well. Um, so it depends upon the school. It's definitely something good to look for um, if one kid's interested in the same school as the other. Um, just one other question that I wasn't real positive about is um, if you need to kind of add two incomes together and you've already done data retrieval, sh should you be changing the populated income or is there never a scenario where you need to do that? So if you're using a data retrieval tool, you shouldn't, it's going to carry over your adjusted gross income. There should be no reason to change that. It is the verified adjusted gross income, you know, verified by the mm -hmm. IRS. Where you have to hand enter is if when there are two parents on the FAFSA, it wants to separate out the income that's earned from working for each parent. And so if both of you work, then you'll need to get both of your W-2s and input then into parent one, what one parent makes, parent two, the other parent's information. It could also be that one parent works. So then all the wages are going to go in the one parent and then zero is the other. It's important to not only to fill it those questions in, but then to also fill them in accurately because believe it or not, that does affect the expected family contribution. How many people, like whether it's one person working, no people working or two people working. So um, that's what, you, and when you do the data retrieval tool, those items on your FAFSA will still be blank. They won't say transferred from IRS. So you'll know that would be your cue to fill that information in manually. And there are also, so that you know, um, you know, we're not doing the FAFSA right now, but when you're doing it, you'll see that there's little question mark icons next to every single question. So you can click and get help on each individual question. Um, and it is, for the most part, helpful. Yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes when you get into the really, really out there situations, you can't get what you need there. But I find for most families, I'm able to get what we need just from within the FAFSA. All right. We have wrapped up all of our questions. Um, so I think that we are set for the night, folks. Um, this has been recorded, so I do uh, plan on posting this um, out later this week um, to my YouTube channel, and then I'll email once that is available as well. Thank you so much, folks. Have a fantastic night.